morning, everyone. How are you doing? Happy Sunday to you. Did everybody get your name tags on the way in? These are going to be important later, um, but if you didn't get them, we can either bring some to you or run back out and grab them. Um, today, we're in uh, Acts chapter 4. We're going to spend some time really talking about the significance of names, what they mean and why we have them and what that looks like in the context of Acts chapter 4. And so today, we're going to do something we do every Sunday, which is we're going to sing and declare in the name of Jesus. And here's what's important. When we, when we declare, when we use the name Jesus, we're not just talking about a far off distant person. We're actually invoking the very presence. That's what happens when we use a name. And so today when we sing and the songs that we sing, we're going to be declaring the name of Jesus. And I want you to think about this as we, as we stand to sing today, that when you say that name, it isn't someone far off, but the one who has come near. Uh, I love how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message version. The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. I, I love thinking about that. Like, oh yeah, he's right here. Not far off, but right in our midst. So today we're going to declare those things as we sing. Can we stand together? In John chapter 3, it's probably the most famous verse. Uh, John three sixteen. For God so, anybody? Loved the world that he sent his one and only son. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And I love that he not only sent him, but he named him. When the angel appears to Mary and then Joseph both times says, this is what's going to happen and this will be his name and here is why. And so we're going to unpack that today. But as we declare that ahead of time, just know that we are declaring the name of the one who has come near. So Father, we thank you today that you so loved the world that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, not to condemn, but to save, to redeem, to rescue, to heal. And today we... Uh, I'm hoping we're here because we want more of that, more redemption, more forgiveness, more healing, more deliverance, because the person we are is not the person we're going to be, and the place we are is not where we've been, and it's not yet where we're going to be. You continue to take us forward into the future that awaits us. So today, we sing our way into that. In Jesus' name, amen. a prodigal story Saved out of the enemy's plans for me I'm home in the house of God My life is a rescue story I have free
free where the spirit of the lord is there i will be where the spirit of the lord is i am free is where the presence of the lord is there i will be where the presence of the lord is presence of the Lord is, there I will be, where the presence of the Lord is.
before the throne of grace Majesty before my eyes I'll let it take my breath away A million angels fall Face down on the floor All to echo holy The next song we're going to sing is called Come Thy Fount. If you don't know this song, there's a lot of words. And I know that sometimes when I'm in worshiping the Lord, whatever setting that's in, when there's a lot of words, it's easy for my mind to just wander and just kind of sing on autopilot. But I want you to really take these words because this song is written for us. You know, there's some worship songs written for God, like exaltation. And then there's songs written for us, like this one. All the words are a reminder to us. But then we get to the bridge, and it's really just a declaration. We say, here's my heart, here's my heart, here's my heart, here's my heart. And it's easy to think like, okay, we get it, here's my heart. But it's really a time to just declare, like, Lord, I'm laying my whole heart down to you. Even when there's way too many words going on, even though there's so much going on at work or in school or whatever your life situation looks like, it's a lot sometimes and we have the opportunity to just say here's my heart and just repeat that and believe that and so we're going to sing this and then once we get to the bridge we're just going to declare together that here's my heart for you god so sing come thou fount with me come thou fount of every blessing tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet. Sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain. Fixed upon it, mount of God's unchanging love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure. Safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood.
part together. Here's my heart. 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 Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart. Here's my heart. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Father, we thank you so much for just your presence and being here with us today. And we thank you that we can trust you with everything that we have, not just our hearts, Lord, but especially with our hearts because I know that some of us guard things closest to us there. So I just thank you for that, and I thank you for what you're going to speak through Pastor Bill today. And I pray that we would honor you, Lord, and you would speak to us today. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Welcome to the collective, everybody. Take a minute to say some say hello to somebody next to you that you maybe don't know, and then you can have a seat. Okay, 
There we go. Wow. It just happened. My name is Adriana. Welcome to the Collective Church. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> All right. We have a few events coming up, as always, that we are looking forward to. Um, but here's your morning quiz. What event is coming up on Friday? Yes, I've done my job. <laughs> I've announced it every week, and we know what's coming up. Friday is our ladies' paint and sip night. Um, it's going to be so much fun. Think charcuterie, beautiful drinks, lovely decor. Um, and I have a little challenge for us. Um, someone reminded me this week, like, hey, is this an open event? Can we invite anyone? And yes, it is. So my challenge for myself this week is to think about who I'm going to invite and invite them. Could be a friend, could be a neighbor, could be just kind of an acquaintance. But let's just all kind of say, okay, we're going to step outside our comfort zone and invite someone to this event. Yes? Okay, why not? Um, and with all of our events, they are on our app. We, the Collective Church, have an app. You can um, search the Collective Church in your app store. If you need any help with this, there's always somebody at the welcome wall um, following service, and we'd be happy to get that set up on your phone so you can get reminders and you can RSVP and sign up and do all that stuff through the app. Yes? On August 4th, we are having a blood drive here from 9 to 3, um, and we just feel it's an important event to give blood. So we decided we're going to host that. We've actually hosted it in the past as well, but our date is coming up soon, and we would love, if it's something that you do regularly and you're wanting to give blood, if you could sign up soon, that would be so good, because if we don't get enough sign-ups, I think we don't get to have the blood drive. Does that make sense? So... Nine to three, if you're able to steal away for a little bit from work and come, um, I may or may not promise like otter pops or something of that nature, right? Okay. The next event after that is going to be on August 21st, and that is going to be our back to school barbecue. And we are having that on a Sunday right after service here at the church. So that's like easy peasy. You're already here. You're just going to go right out there and enjoy your barbecue. It is a potluck, though, so we'd love to invite you guys to um, bring sides, and there's, there's all sorts of sign-ups we can help you with um, as you visit the Collective Church app. After that, we have our men's retreat on August 26th to the 28th. We've had a lot of sign-ups in the recent week, so if you haven't signed up yet, please do. It's up at, um, I just spaced it. Thank you, Sawtooth Lodge, Loman, I think, area camping, yurts, there is one yurt spot left that has a bed. So if you're like, that's me, I need a bed, you better sign up like right now. Yeah? Otherwise, you're, you're welcome to sign up for the yurt. You just may not be promised a bed. So you might have to bring an air mattress, but you're still out of the elements. It's still a yurt versus like tent camping. So I think that's all the announcements we have. We're going to continue our journey through Acts. This is our fifth week in the Heaven and Earth series. I'd like to invite Bill up. <laughs> it's back. Did somebody whistle at me? I think I heard a whistle. I appreciate it. No, I take that. I'll take I'll take anything I can get. Hey, good morning. It's good to see your faces. Thanks for spending some time with us. If you're new with us, thanks for being here. Uh, there's a lot of places you could be. Um, we're glad you're here with us this morning. We'd love to meet you after service as well. Uh, we've got a gift for you also. We are in our Heaven and Earth series as we walk through the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles, way to access the scripture, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Now, as we jump into this, I'm going to read to us all of Acts chapter 4, and then I'm going to spend some time uh, focusing in. I'm going to offer a few thoughts on uh, what we find in that uh, text, and I'm going to take us a couple different places uh, throughout the Word today. So um, keep it handy so that you see it in front of you as well, but most of this will be on the screen also. Again, this is week 5. Last week, uh, we spent some time, two weeks ago, we talked about how Peter and John were going to the gate called Beautiful. They see a man who had been lame from birth. We find out he's over 40 years old, and he is begging for a little change. And in that, he got a whole lot more than he bargained for because he didn't get something temporary. 
that went cling and clank. He actually got something eternal. He was healed. Peter and John said, um, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have we give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. And the man stood to his feet for the first time in his life and holding on to Peter and John, go into the temple for the first time in his life and begin to celebrate, jumping and praising God. And people begin to take notice of this. And then John or Peter takes this opportunity as people come running in astonishment to preach a sermon. And in that sermon we talked about last week, there are several different elements in that that we unpacked. Um, repent and turn to God so that you're Sins may be wiped away in times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So we unpacked that statement, that declaration by Peter last week. And now, uh, as we jump into chapter 4, what we discover is this sermon, this stir, this excitement in the temple has garnered the attention of the religious elite, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, the Sanhedrin. Uh, they've taken notice, and they are not happy they're happy that people are praising God, but they're not happy that it didn't come through them. So they're mad about this. Have you ever had that moment where you're like, oh, you know how many times I've said that? You know, it's like our kids, right? Like, I have told them countless times. And then, you know, they come home and they're like, you know, you know what I've, somebody told me I'm supposed to do? I'm like, yes, I've spoke that to you since you were a baby. <laughs> and now you get it, right? Like, and so they're mad. They are angry about this. And so they begin to take action. So that's where we pick up the story today in Acts chapter 4. I'm going to have this on the screen for us as well. Now, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees, this is a big group of people. There are actually about 71 of them. They came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who uh, believed grew to about 5,000. Now, if you remember, not long ago, Peter stood up and preached a sermon on Pentecost, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, this just says the number of men grew to about 5,000. You multiply that probably times three, maybe four, sometimes five, uh, depending on the family, and this is a big group of people. It grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers and the elders uh, and the teachers of the law big group of angry people met in Jerusalem. Now, Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if you we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame um, and are being asked how he was healed. Know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Then they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were ordinary, unschooled men. They, had, uh, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since... They could see the man who had been healed standing there with them. There was really nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows how they have performed a noble sign. That's the word samia. It's a, a distinguishing mark, something that set them apart because of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. They've seen this unfold, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone 
in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them to speak, not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You, uh, you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And after further threats, they let them go. They could uh, not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the men, for the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Now, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, this big crowd that was gathered in the temple, and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, may uh, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together um, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, this is how they finish. Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. That, my friends, is the word of the Lord. There is a significant amount taking place in that text. Now, I'm going to focus for our sake this morning in on one sort of aspect of what we find in here. Now, I want to offer a few thoughts um, on names. I want to offer a few thoughts on our names, maybe how we see each other, maybe how we see ourselves, maybe how the world sees us, and then offer a few thoughts on how maybe God sees us. Because uh, names are important. Now, in this text, we read uh, six different times the word name appears in these verses. Names are interesting. They're fascinating. Some are easy to um, pronounce and others are incredibly hard. If you have ever gone uh, and spent time in the Old Testament, which I love spending time in the epic stories of the Old Testament, you get maybe if you, not so much in Numbers, uh, or in First and Second Chronicles, but you know, you get into some of those, and you're like, oh, I don't know how to pronounce this. Mephibosheth, like, what? Huh? What did you just call me? I mean, some of these names or cities or towns are hard to perform, but names are interesting. My my name is William Clayton Briley. Like, that's my given name. I didn't give it to myself. Uh, that was a name given to me, William Clayton Briley. Now. My name, William, means um, strong-willed warrior, is what William means. Clayton means from the earth, and Briley means noble or, or strong. N names are interesting because they're not given the way that they used to be given. Now, I, for about three days, was actually Baby Craig. Could, can, you, can you picture that? I mean, for those of you who've known me, maybe you're like, oh, there's no way. Uh-uh. You can't pull off Craig. You can't even pull off Bill. But you know, for those of you who are meeting me for the first time, maybe you're like, oh, yeah, you could totally see Craig. But I was baby Craig for like three days. And as mom and dad were in the hospital, um, they're holding me. And my mom's like, uh-uh, you are a spitting image of your dad. We're changing it. And so I called the nurse in. They had already filled out the birth certificate. And she's like, I want to change his name. Well, 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 we already had the birth certificate filled out. I'm like, uh, this is kind of a long-term thing. I think it's okay maybe to change the name. And so they had to go and redo the birth certificate. And I went from Baby Craig to Baby Billy. But names are interesting. Moses, our oldest son, 
His name means drawn from the water. Jonah, our middle child, his name means dove. Bella, our youngest, uh, her name means fulfilled promise and beautiful. Uh, as maybe some of you know, we, we tried for seven years to get pregnant and we held on to this promise that God said, it will happen, we just didn't get the win. And so, you know, year after year, month after month, you just wait. And so we named her Bella because she was a fulfilled promise. Names are powerful. They're not only interesting, but they're, they're incredibly important. And in the book of Acts, 19 different times throughout the book of Acts, what we discover is that the phrase, in Jesus' name, or in the name of Jesus, appear 19, again, different times. 19 different times throughout, the phrase repeats itself over and over again. Let me, let me give you just a couple. Peter realized, this is in Acts chapter 2, we covered this several weeks ago, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 3, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Chapter 3, again, a little further down. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Chapter 4, where we are today, we read this earlier. Then, how, uh, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Just a couple more. Salvation, this is implied with Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now, I put that one in there specifically because it is implied, Peter is talking about Jesus, but this right here is treason. Like, Peter repeats imperial language back to these powerful people. See, this was a phrase that, uh, that was coined by Caesar. It was known throughout the empire that there is no other name under heaven by which mankind can be saved except Caesar. This was imperial language. I mean, this is stuff that results in death. And here he is standing before these powerful people who had great relationship with Rome. And he says, listen, I know that you're still waiting for the Savior, but the Savior of the world, the Messiah has already come, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. And I want you to know that by Caesar, none of this is possible. Only through the name of Jesus. That's where salvation comes. And salvation is that, that uh, Hebrew word, sozo. I'm sorry, uh, Greek word, sozo. And it means saved, healed, and delivered. It's this word that is packed full of meaning and significance for us. A little later in chapter 4, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And as they begin to, to end their time together, they say, stretch out your hand, heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. See, this matters. This is important because the whole of the book of Acts, it's all about this missional momentum from the church and their understanding of the power and the um, presence and the purpose that they've been given to go and be the witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You have a, a mission, a task to undertake. And I want you to know that you cannot accomplish it on your own. Wait for the gift that my father promised, right? We have unpacked that. But this matters because these folks are in this place, stepping forward in that mission. And their understanding and the use of the word name, though, in their day, was very different than in our day. Now, same word, name here, name there, but the way they applied that name was significantly different. So I want to just take us back just a bit. Now, most scholars agree that Acts was written, well, I don't know if there's any disagreement on who wrote it, uh, Luke, but when it was written, there's, you know, it can vary within a couple of years, but in the early 60s. 61, 62, 63. So, you know, roughly 30 years after Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected. 
So that, that's the timeline on which this was written. And the culture then with them was very different than here with us, as you might imagine. There are lots of differences. One of those differences is that they lived in a predominantly oral culture. We live in a predominantly written culture. And the way that they communicated and what some of the things they communicated meant were significantly different for them than they are for us. And so, when someone in the ancient world would say something, it meant something, and what was spoken, um, two things came out of that. So in the ancient world, when someone would speak, the result was two different things. Now, there were lots of things that did happen, but there were two very specific things that took place. Number one, the spoken word or the words that were spoken by a person were inextricably linked and bound to the person speaking them. There was no separation. The person speaking them was the same as what they were speaking. And the second thing that would happen is the spoken word or words instantly vanished. So while they remained attached to the person, the the words all of a sudden were gone, sort of like the mist or the vapor. You speak a word and you can't keep a hold of it. It disappears. It's gone. Here one moment, gone the next, but inextricably tied to the person who spoke those words. There was no difference between the knower, and what was known. They were inseparable in Jesus' day. But in our written culture, things are a little bit different. Uh, The moment something is written or or typed, uh, it becomes other than the person who writes it or types it. There, There is something that is outside of me now that is in a different medium or form that's that stands apart from me. It doesn't just disappear into the air. It goes somewhere, sort of like this. Like this is being recorded and posted in different places and there are people watching online. And so you could rewatch what we did last week, the worship in the word. And you may recognize the people, but it stands apart from the people who participated. There's a, there's a separation that takes place. This sort of separation, though, was very foreign in an oral culture. So now back to names for a moment. Um, the, again, the Hebrew culture in which Jesus grew up in, in the ancient world, it was inseparable what was spoken from the person speaking it. When you spoke someone's name, what you did is you were invoking the very presence of that person. It wasn't just a flippant, hey, uh, have you guys ever had a chance to meet Bill or Julie or Jim or Cecilia? Or Joe, anybody ever met them? No, I haven't met them. So to speak a name for us is a designator, not something that brings description. It's just a designator that sets me apart from you. There's a lot of things that do that, but my name is one of those. And oftentimes we get duplicate names. I have a pretty common name, Bill or William. But my name also has meaning, like yours. And unless you changed your name, someone else gave it to you. And mine was given because I looked like my dad. My name wasn't given because of any specific thing I did or was going to do or was for my future. It was something that set me apart and a designator of sorts. In the Hebrew culture, to speak a name was to invoke the person. This is powerful. I mean, every time we pray, I don't think we think about it oftentimes, but we often end prayer by saying, in the name of God. Jesus. So not only are we designated in whose name we are praying, but in that we're doing much more because we're invoking the presence of Jesus when we in fact pray and we use that name. Now, we don't oftentimes associate that. We're just making sure that when we pray, we're not praying to someone else, somewhere else. We want to make sure you know who we, whose name we're praying in. Now, check this out. There's 10 commandments. It's written in a couple different places in the Old Testament. And one of those places is in Exodus, the first time. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Look at this. This is one of the ten. I mean, you could stick anything in the big ten, right? 
anything. And this is one of the things God chose to give his people. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And you're like, what? Well, I mean, does that mean I use it in a, a cuss word? <laughs> right? I attach it to a, another word that, that we have that is supposed to invoke some sort of emotion? Right? Is that taking the Lord's name in vain? Well, maybe. But this is one of the big ten. There's something else going on here that we oftentimes don't understand. And it's that when you use a name, you are not just using it as a, dis as a, a distinguishing um, descriptor. You're actually invoking the very presence of the person whom you're speaking. Now, that word vain, uh, it could also be translated misuse. Um, but it means uh, emptiness nothingness, vanity, emptiness of speech, lying, or worthlessness. It means that I would carelessly invoke, use the name, and try to detach it from the person. Separating the, the knower and what is known. I mean, do not take the Lord's name in vain. That's a big ten. Why? Because you're invoking. That's what it meant you're invoking the very presence of the person whom you speak. So, to take again the Lord's name flippantly or carelessly or with worthless or empty intentions was, was to misuse the Lord's name or to use the, name, the Lord's name in vain. Now, Jesus has something to say about this too. Matthew chapter seven. There's a group of people and it, we don't know how big the group of people were. We don't know anything about them except that they were doing things in Jesus' name. Now, they were attempting to do something that would have been very taboo in their culture. So Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Okay. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Like, you're going to say this stuff to me. You are going to stand before me, and you're going to say, we invoked your name, but we ignored your presence. We wanted the provision that came with your name, the power that came along with it, but you ignored my very presence. That's what saves. Not the provision, not the byproduct, but the very person. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. And Jesus goes on to say, away from me, you evildoers. And I remember, you know, as I was studying through the passage, I'm like, this makes a whole lot more sense. I mean, sometimes you're just like, I said, Lord, Lord. I mean, didn't I do what you wanted me to do? I was on mission. You told the disciples at one point, go, declare the kingdom of heaven, drive out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, proclaim this message. And they're like, who are we doing that? Well, you were, you were wanting the provision apart from the presence. You used the name and forgot you were invoking the person. You ignore the most important piece. People who are trying to separate the knower from what was known. And for us today, um, we use names as, again, designators, I, I would contend, more than descriptors. We assign names to our children so that when <laughs> you are at Chuck E. Cheese, with all the games, kids, and germs. And when it's finally time to go, you can declare in a loud voice, Moses! And he knows I'm talking to him, right? And so you can use that name when it's finally time to leave that place that you're never going to get clean from. I mean, that is so important that they know 
you're talking to them. And you know, I don't know about you guys, but we also assign middle names, right? It's Moses Liam Briley. So we assign middle names to our kids so that we can make sure they know when they have really <laughs> done something wrong, right? I mean, that's the only time that comes out, right? Not naturally do I get, uh, hey, William Clayton Briley or Billy, as my family calls me, uh, Billy Clayton. I mean, nobody calls me that. I mean, that's only invoked when you've done something wrong. But names are significant and they're important. Man, in the ancient world, though, different than us, names were um, designators. Were not designators, but they were descriptors of the person. So let me give you a couple examples. Um, we first meet this man named Abram in uh, Genesis chapter 12. Now, Abram. His name means exalted father. Now, if you're familiar with the text, you know at a later time, his name was changed from Abram to Abraham. He goes from exalted father to father of many nations. So God was not just changing his name because he wanted something better. He was describing the person that Abraham was going to be. Moses, again, drawn from the water. Isaac means laughter. Esau means hairy. Harry, Rebecca, this was his mom, means captivating or a snare. Deborah means bee, and bees had significant um, significance in the Hebrew culture. Jesus, his name, uh, the name Jesus is derived from the Hebrew name uh, Yeshua or Yeshua, and it means to deliver or to rescue. I mentioned this earlier, but remember an angel appeared to Mary, and then separately Joseph, and said, this is what's going to happen. And I want you to give him this name. Because this name isn't just going to um, be a designator. It's a descriptor of who he is. Because he, he is going to save people from their sins. He's going to rescue them. He's going to deliver them. He's going to redeem them. That's that word sozo, right? Saved, healed, delivered. That's what Jesus came to do. Caesar could do none of those things, though he thought he could, and he convinced other people that he would, but it was only in the name of Jesus. When you say it, speak it, invoking the very presence that does the transforming work in our lives. Jesus himself, in John chapter 15, Verse 16 said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed uh, you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. See, when you, when you ask something, when you're in that place of prayer and when you say, in Jesus' name, you're, you're not just making sure people around you know in whose name you're praying. You're invoking the presence of the person you're speaking of. And see, I love that the Bible tells us there's no place we can go where he is not. Right? And Jesus said, listen, I will not leave you as orphans. Right? I must go. It's important that I do so that I can send another one exactly like the presence of me will come and be with you forever. I will not leave you as orphans. And when you use my name, my presence is right there with you. Man. Names are important. My name. Is Bill. Now in the Bible we meet another man named Jacob. Jacob's brother is Esau. Esau, his name means hairy. And I mean, I don't mean just like, I think I'm hairy. That's, that, that's super weird. That's not my notes. I'll just, let me, I'm gonna stick to my notes. Uh, his name means hairy, okay? Um, and here's what's interesting. When, when we first kind of meet them, um, Rebecca, their mom, is giving birth to them, and, and Esau comes out first, and then right after Esau, we, we see this hand, the hand of Jacob, holding onto the heel of his brother. And so they named him Jacob. 
Jacob has a meeting, which we'll get to in a minute. But as the story unfolds, and really as we get to know Jacob, what we discover is that Jacob is trying to be someone else. Jacob doesn't like his place in life. He doesn't like the person that he's become. And so he's trying to be someone else. That's kind of how we really get to know Jacob. So you've got Esau and you've got Jacob. Now, back in Genesis chapter 27, it says, Then Rebecca, mom, took, uh, nope, hang on. Is that what I want to do? No. We're going to get to that in a moment. So we discover that uh, Jacob begins to live into the very name that he's been given. So the, the name of Jacob can mean uh, the root of it is heel because he actually had a hold of the heel of his brother. But there's a much broader uh, meaning to the name Jacob. The name Jacob can mean deceiver. It can mean trickster. And it has pretty profound meaning. And what we discover is that when we meet Jacob later on in the story, he's living into his very name. Like, we're going to call you Jacob because there's something going on here. And God spoke to uh, Rebecca ahead of time and said, there is a battle going on inside of your womb. And um, one nation will kind of battle against the other. And he, he begins to describe to her. And so they name them appropriately as descriptors of who they would become. And this is where we meet Jacob. Discontent with his place in life and pretending to be someone else and on the run for his life. Here's why he's on the run for his life. Because he swindled his brother out of his birthright by offering him a bowl of lentil soup. He traded his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup in this moment of poor decision. And so Jacob didn't get the birthright. He wasn't firstborn. He was secondborn. And he took something that wasn't his. And then later he pretends to be someone he's not because he actually wants the blessing, not just the birthright. And so Rebecca overhears Isaac, their dad, speaking to Esau in his old age saying, it's time for me to bless you. So go out into the fields and kill. Kill me, kill me uh, some game, some wild game, and fix me my favorite meal. Come bring it to me and then I will bless you. Well, Rebecca overhears this, and she pulls Jacob alongside and says, all right, listen, I've got the best of your brother's clothes hanging around, and I want you to go out into the barn, pick out some wild game, bring it to me, I'll cook his favorite meal, and then we're gonna take the skin of that goat, and I'm gonna put it on your hands and on your neck. So you're gonna smell like your brother, and you're gonna feel like your brother, and you're gonna pretend to be your brother to get the blessing. And so Jacob, it says, took the food to his father. My father, he said. Yes, my son, Isaac answered. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? Immediately he knows something's up. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? Jacob replied, it's Esau, your firstborn son. I've done as you told me. Here's the wild game. Now sit and eat it so you can give me your blessing. Isaac asked, how did you find it so quickly, my son? Now, I'm going to give you an example of what it looks like to use the Lord's name in vain. You ready? How did you, how did you do this so quickly? Well, the Lord, your God, put it in my path. Boom, there it was. There I was. Arrow, dead, cooked, served. He lied. That, that's one of the things it means to take the Lord's name in vain is to lie, to, to use the Lord's name in a way that is inconsistent with his purpose. So he invokes the very presence of the Lord and then lies in that same moment. Then the Lord, your God, put it in my path, Jacob replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come closer so I can touch you and make sure that you are really Esau. So Jacob went closer to his father and Isaac touched him. The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's, Isaac said. But he did not recognize Jacob because Jacob's hands felt hairy, just like Esau's. So Isaac prepared to bless Jacob. But are you really my, it's one last effort. But are you really my son Esau, he asked. Yes, I am, Jacob replied. 
And we meet Jacob in a pretty rough place, living into his name, swindling, deceiving, lying, stealing. He's Jacob. And then we meet him just a little bit later in Genesis chapter 32. He's on the run for his life because he's swindled his brother out of birthright and then stole his blessing. Esau is furious, as you might imagine, because giving that blood, it wasn't like Esau's like, well, do it again. And he's like, I can't do it again. It's once and done. That's how it works. And so Esau is furious and he goes after his brother to kill him. He's irate. I get nothing. You get the blessing by lying and pretending to be someone you're not because you're not happy with who you are. And so, fearing for his life, he's on the run. He takes his possessions and his family, and he sends them out across the Jabbok River. And there's a plan to try to appease Esau to save his own life. So he sends a bunch of his possessions and a few of his servants to, like, soften the blow, if you will. And in order to protect his family and the rest of his possessions, he sends them on ahead across the river, a safer place. And then there he is all alone. Night falls, and then Jacob is met by someone. And they wrestle all night long. And at daybreak, they've been wrestling all night long, and something unique happens. The man said, so it says the man said, Jacob realizes it after this moment is over, that he was face to face with God. It said, the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, what is your name? I mean, he's face to face with the God of the cosmos. And he hears this question. But the question has deeper meaning. The, the question is, what is your name? But what he's being asked is, who are you? Who are you? How am I to know who I'm supposed to bless if you don't know who you are? So who are you? Jacob, he answered. And then, when Jacob is finally at a place where he's content to be where he is and who he is, the God of the cosmos knows it and says, your name will no longer be Jacob. You spent your whole life trying to be someone else, swindling, tricking, stealing, lying, on the run for your life. You've spent your whole life in that place. And now that you're ready to come to terms with who you are and what you've done, it's time for a new name. Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have over wrestled all night long. And Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? God essentially says, you need to be concerned about who you are now. You already know who I am. Then he blessed him there. And so Jacob called the place Penile, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. You have a couple name tags. We're going to move to a time of response. My name is Bill. But sometimes we're not only asking, you know, what is your name, but, but who are you? And here's what I want to ask. Who are, who are you? Who, who do you think you are? Who do other people think you are? 
like that says failure. I made a lot of mistakes in my life. A lot. And it's easy for me to focus on those mistakes and go, yeah, failed, failed, failed. Failed at my first marriage. Divorced. How about this one? Oh. Clearly, I'm not supposed to put that on my chest. Fearful. Who are you? Yeah. Yeah, fearful. I can be fearful. Forgotten. Have you ever felt abandoned? I just feel like, does, it, does anybody care? Dyslexic. can't talk in front of people. You can't even read. You can't phonetically work through something. How are you supposed to be used by God? I'm a dad. Three beautiful children, Moses and Jonah and Bella. I'm a husband. Again, to my beautiful bride, Julie. But as I start to drill down, I realize that there's more. I'm also forgiven. Not because of what I've done, but because I've invoked the name of Jesus. I'm also Free. Free from all that stuff. And because of that, I'm also safe. But more importantly than any of that, I'm a son. Nothing in my past, or in my present, or in my future, that is more powerful than the present freedom that's found in evoking the name of Jesus. Nothing, nothing, nothing that you've done or nothing that's been done to you. So I wanna ask you to do this as a time of response. On one, I want you to actually write your name. Stick it on your shirt. And then I want you to take a few minutes. The band is just going to play. And as they do, I want you to think about this. Who are you? You just wrote your name there, but I want to know who are you. I don't want to know who you think you are. I don't want to know who the world thinks you are. I want you to hear from the God of the cosmos who created you and knit you together. I want to know who that person is. And then what I want you to do is take that, and put it right over that name. Because you have a descriptor of who you are, a designator, I should say. But I want the descriptor. Who are you? I want you to take a few minutes and do that. You've got a marker. You've got, does everybody have the, if you don't have them, can you raise your hand? We'll bring you. Uh, we got a couple. Can we grab that bucket? Um, we've got the markers and the name tags right here. The first one is your name. The next is how God sees you. Because that's who you are. Period. Not what you've done. Not what's been done to you. Not the reputation that you carry. Because see, the moment that you come to terms with like, yeah, I, I've got that stuff. I, I've been in that place. I've done it. When you realize that you invoke the name of Jesus, there's freedom. 
And that, that covers over, because of love, a multitude of failures, sins, because we're created to be free. And so as the band plays uh, and as you get those filled out and stuck on, I want to I wanna then ask you at that point to stand. And as you stand, just come forward. The table is open. We take communion every week as a reminder of what's been done for us. Jesus said, when you gather together, I want you to remember me. Not like, oh, yeah, cool, someone else, somewhere else. I want you to remember me. And when you do, I want you to take these elements that represent what I've done for you. See, these elements for us, I think, could be simple elements. They could be like, oh, yeah, cool. It's cracker and wine and juice. I, I get to choose. There's both. I would contend that the table itself and the elements don't represent just the elements. They represent the very presence of Jesus. I'm not referring to transubstantiation in this, but I'm referring to the fact that it means more than crackers and juice. We take that and we actually are invoking the very presence of the one who offered us the life that we experience. And if you need prayer today, I'd love, we could, we'll have a team up here, we'd love to pray for you. Maybe Jesus isn't Lord of your life and you're like, you know what? Gosh, I, I don't even know how God sees me. No clue. Because I don't know God. And maybe by getting to know God, you get to know how he sees you. I promise it's way better than you see yourself. And so, Father, we thank you that this is what we get to do. We get to keep together the knower and what's known. We don't have to separate these things. And so when we say, Jesus, we acknowledge that you are here with us and your name brings freedom, and healing, deliverance, rescue. And so we thank you for that. Praise you. And it's in your powerful and resurrected name we pray. Amen. If, you're, if you've got them on there, let's stand together. And then uh, as the band plays, come. The table is open and everyone is free to come.
evening when I close my eyes You're still the only one I want to cling to You're the last thought on my mind So Father, we thank you for who we are in you, that we are loved, that we are your sons and your daughters. Lord, please help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. Help us to see ourselves the way that you created us to be. And Lord, to know that because of the sacrifice you made through your son Jesus, that we can be called loved, that we are your sons and your daughters, and that we can step in to the life that you have prepared for us. So we thank you, we praise you, and we love you, Jesus. Pray all this for your powerful name. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us today. It was a pleasure to worship with you all. Again, if you're new here, we would love to meet you. Uh, right out in the lobby, we have our welcome wall. Please come by and say hello. Um, again, we, we have our app and our weekly update with all the upcoming events. Uh, check it out. Let us know if you have any questions, and we would love to see you around. Uh, lastly, if you're going to give a tither and offering today, you can do that a couple ways as well, uh, through our app, through our website. We got the old school bo tithe boxes over there, um, and feel free to do that on your way out. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Blessings to you all this week.
when we see you everything else fades away your love tells our fear it can't stay when we see you to be Stand together, all of us singing. Heaven and earth bow and wonder, all of us singing. We adore you, Lord, more than anything. You're the In the beauty of your holiness, the splendor of your majesty, the wonder of your excellence, we worship for the King. Yeah.